19. John chapter 19, and the title of the message is Sorrow Before Joy. Sorrow Before Joy. John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verse 1. So Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out, sat down in the judgment seat in a place that's called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation day of Passover, about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. And he delivered him to them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him, two others with him, one on either side, Jesus in the center. Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified, was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. And then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments, made four parts, each soldier a part, and also the tunic, and the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece, they said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. And they stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. The soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And immediately, blood and water came out. He who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth. 
that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate when he might take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. So they took the body of Jesus, bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. And in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Well, it's hard to believe that Easter's next week. It's come right up on us. And we're looking forward to celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior uh, with all of you. It's always a great time, a special time, doing it as a family. But before we read about the resurrection and the joy that it brings to our hearts, we must first read about the crucifixion, which uh, is the saddest part of the story. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, the Passion of the Christ movie came out. And... Uh, I'd heard stories about people in the theaters watching it and then being in tears, crying as they watched the actor that was playing Jesus be tortured uh, and executed. And so when it came out on DVD, a friend of mine invited me and some other um, friends over to watch the movie. And I'd seen several movies about Jesus over the years. Uh, my favorite one is uh, um, Jesus, um, is the one... Um, it's, it's on the Gospel of Luke. It's a Jesus called the Jesus Movie. It's from the 70s, I think, is when they made that. That one's my favorite, but this is a really good one, too. Um, the Passion of the Christ did something that the other Jesus movies I'd seen hadn't done. Uh, it focused on the horrible, painful, torturous treatment of Jesus by the Romans and Jews. Um, in one scene, a Roman soldier has a whip with sharp pieces of metal and uh, bones attached to the ends. And so then uh, for over five minutes in the scene, it shows the soldier whipping Jesus. Um, probably was a lot longer uh, in, in, uh, when it actually happened, but in the movie, uh, they showed it for five minutes. Uh, so the soldiers that are doing this and the crowd around them are taking pleasure in this brutal, wicked act, but Jesus allows it to happen. And so if I remember, my, my friends and I were in tears as we watched because the entire movie gave us a picture of how Jesus um, was treated in those final hours before his death. Now, of course, that movie wasn't real. It was actors portraying what was happening and didn't come close to what actually happened to Jesus. Uh, it was all special effects, so the actor playing Jesus wasn't actually being whipped. But it puts a picture in our minds of how horrible it must have been when Jesus was tortured before being put on the cross. So it's hard to believe that human beings are capable of such evil, but we are. Let's look today at the final events leading up to the crucifixion. So first we see this verdict that was reached about Jesus and was the worst verdict ever reached. Uh, sometimes in courtroom cases, the, finding, the findings of the judge don't, don't make sense. Uh, for example, there was a man in Massachusetts who sued Dunkin' Donuts because they didn't put real butter on his bagel. And that's silly, and you'd think that that would be a case that would be thrown out of court. Um, if you don't want fake butter, go somewhere else or, or buy it yourself. But the judge saw things differently, and this man won this lawsuit. And that's almost as crazy as believing a person is innocent, and yet sentencing them to death, knowing they're innocent, but sentencing them to death. And that's what happened with Pilate. But before he sent him to the cross, he apparently tried to help Jesus. Um, but the way he does it is exactly the opposite. He sends Jesus to be scourged, hoping that it would satisfy the Jews. But scourging wasn't just a simple whipping. Um, it was brutal. As they did it, it, it tore apart the skin and then it exposed the, the veins, it weakened the prisoner before they went to the cross. And uh, Jesus, if that had been the only punishment that they, that they did to him, then um, he would have been you know, lame for life, or he might not have even survived. 
because it was, it was pretty bad. According to one commentator, scourging was a legal preliminary to every Roman execution, and only women and Roman senators or soldiers, except in cases of desertion, were exempt. But scourging wasn't enough. They then put a crown of thorns on his head and a purple robe, mocking his claim to be king. And when I think of thorns, I think of small ones on bushes or plants. You know, they, they hurt if you get pricked by them. They're small. But the spikes on Jesus' head were made of, uh, made with thorns from a date palm. And those thorns could grow up to 12 inches. Uh, and they didn't just place it there. They put it on and they twisted it and pushed it down so that the spikes were dug into his skull. Now, at that point, when Pilate brings Jesus out for the crowd to see, uh, he should have let Jesus go. Jesus was beaten and bruised and in pain, but that wasn't enough for the Jews. Crucify him, they shouted. Uh, it's sickening and it's unbelievable that the crowd took pleasure in the suffering of Jesus and they wanted to see more. The Jewish religious leaders continued to use Pilate as their puppet, backing him into corner bullying him until he does what they want. And there's three ways here that I see the, um, the Jews get into Pilate's head. First, they publicly overwhelmed him by choosing Barabbas, stirring up the crowd to shout for Jesus' crucifixion. So Pilate had to do something. Second, they got into his head religiously. They said he claimed to be the Son of God. And so the Jews, that was blasphemy. It was worthy of death, and they, they didn't fear the consequences of setting him to the cross. But the Romans were very superstitious. So to Pilate, if Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, that meant that he was claiming to be divine, uh, and he could take vengeance on Pilate and on Rome for their wicked treatment of him. So you'd think that with this fear in mind, he would have let Jesus go. Um, and his, his wife actually tried to, tried to get him to let Jesus go, but he didn't listen to her. But there was a third way that the Jews got into his head, and that was politically. That if you, if you let him go, you're not a friend of Caesar's, and we'll make sure that he knows it. It was a sly move on their part, and it worked. Pilate couldn't let Jesus go. He tried, but it was no use. Imagine how much more Pilate must have hated the Jews after this. You know, they made him look like a weak fool in public. The Romans hate to feel or look weak. Now, one of the things that stands out to me is in verse 15, Pilate says, Behold your king. Obviously, Pilate didn't believe that. He was just saying it to make them angry. But what I thought was interesting is that here you have Pilate, a Gentile, with the Messiah standing right in front of him. And the Jews were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles and to point them to God. So this would have been a great opportunity if the Jewish religious leaders had believed. It would have been an opportunity for um, them to say, yes, he is our king, he's our Messiah, and he can be yours as well. And if their hearts had been in the right place, then Jesus wouldn't have even been uh, beaten here. They would have received him as their Messiah. They would have been with the crowd that was saying, Hosanna, welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem. They would have been right there with them, saying, here is our king. But they weren't. Here, in front of Gentile ruler, they say, no, he's not our king. But then they don't even say that God is their king. Instead, they say, we have no king but Caesar. So, let's think about that for a minute. Uh, we have no king but Caesar. They don't mention God. Scripture says in Psalm 47, verse 7, that the Lord is king of all the earth. Isaiah 33, 22 says that the Lord is our judge, our lawgiver, and our king. Malachi 1, 14 says, I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts. My name is to be feared among the nations. Those are just a few examples. Clearly, God tells Israel that he is their king. He's the king of everyone. Jesus tells Pilate that the reason Pilate has power is because God has given it to him. So the Jews had no business saying, we have no king but Caesar. They were manipulative, 
liars, only wanted their way. But Jesus teaches us so much through his example here. Here's just a few lessons. Jesus had patience. Because he didn't argue with the Jewish leaders or try to defend himself against their lies. And do we have that kind of patience? Patience that Jesus has here. He had strength from his father as he endured the beatings and the mockery and the rejection of his own people. Do we have that same kind of strength? It's a strength that comes only from God. It's a strength that he gives to us. Uh, and it's a strength that many martyrs have had over the years who have gone uh, to be burned at the stake or to be uh, um, killed and eaten by lions or you know all these different martyrs over the years who have been killed in so many brutal different ways. They had that strength. God gave them that strength. Jesus had great love, even as he was beaten for his followers, for us, and even for those who abused him. He showed love, and that's the, that's the kind of love we need to have in our hearts for one another and for the world. Do we have that kind of love? Second, we see here the saddest day on earth. I do believe that the crucifixion was the saddest day on earth. Jesus endured so much pain for you and for me because of his love for us. C. Truman Davis was a medical doctor who wrote about the crucifixion of Jesus from a doctor's standpoint. And in my opinion, it's one of the, the best and uh, in-depth uh, descriptions I've ever read of the crucifixion. It says, Jesus was nailed to a cross with heavy, square, wrought iron nails through his wrists and through his feet. He hung there for several hours. When his body slumped, excruciating, fiery pain would shoot along the fingers and up the arms to explode in the brain. The nails and the wrists were putting pressure on the median nerves. As he pushed himself upward to avoid this stretching torment, he placed the full weight on the nail through his feet. Again, he felt the searing agony of the nail tearing through the nerves between the bones of the feet. As the arms fatigue, cramps sweep through the muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. And with these cramps comes the inability to push himself upward to breathe. Air can be drawn into the lungs, but not exhaled. He fights to raise himself in order to get even one small breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and in the bloodstream. And the cramps partially subside. Spasmodically, he is able to push himself upward to exhale and bring in life-giving oxygen. Hours of limitless pain, cycles of twisting, joint rendering cramps, intermittent partial asphyxiation, searing pain as tissue is torn from his lacerated back as he moves up and down against the rough timber. Then another agony began, a deep crushing pain <coughs> deep in the chest as the pericardium slowly filled with serum and began to compress the heart. It's now almost over. The loss of tissue fluids has reached a critical level, the compressed heart is struggling to pump heavy, thick, sluggish blood into the tissues. The tortured lungs are making a frantic effort to gasp in small gulps of air. He then felt the chill of death creeping through his tissues. Finally, he was able to allow his body to die. Well, I'm glad I wasn't there to see, see that because that would have been way too hard to watch. Um, verse 17 tells us that he bore his cross to the place where they crucified him. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I think to myself, the cross that he carried rightfully belonged to me, and I should have been carrying it. But Jesus did it in my place. He did it for me. My cross became his cross. After they crucified him, Pilate put a sign above him that said, Jesus, King of the Jews. It was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin so that everyone who passed by would be able to read it. Of course, the religious leaders didn't like that, so they tried once again to manipulate Pilate. 
but this time he wouldn't budge. The sign was stained. When I think about that, I wonder, how on earth could Pilate let them manipulate him into crucifying Jesus, but then all of a sudden grow a backbone and say no to the Jews when they want the sign taken down? I believe that this was Pilate's way of saying to the Jews, you might have had your way with this, but I'm the one with power. I'm in control, even though he had lost control. If only he had grown a backbone sooner, then Jesus wouldn't have gone to the cross. But this is all a part of God's plan, and it's what was needed for salvation to enter the world. Now, the Jews weren't the only ones who were in the wrong. The soldiers who crucified Jesus didn't care who he was. They just enjoyed killing Jews. And the proof is that when they take his garments and tunic, they gamble for them. As he's up above them dying, they're, they're down playing games. And they put Jesus through enough humiliation that now they're, they're playing this game, watching uh, those above them, the, uh, Jesus and the two thieves, in pain, slowly dying. And the man in the center, Jesus, happens to be the Son of God. Once again, the thoughtless and evil act actually ended up fulfilling prophecy. This uh, scripture cited is, is from Psalm 22, verse 18, written thousands of years before. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots, exactly as God said would happen. Now, the soldiers had no clue, but God did, and his word once again was true. And the next part of the story really shows us how much love and compassion Jesus had for those he loved. His mother's down below watching. Uh, that was probably the hardest day of her life, seeing him, her son, but her Lord, Jesus, her Savior, who she raised from birth, slowly die a painful death. But even in his pain, Jesus takes the time to show that he cares about those he loves. He tells John, the Apostle John, who was uh, down there with Mary, tells him that Mary will be his mother, and he tells Mary John will be her son. And that really uh, stood out to me. Jesus is in the worst uh, pain and agony of his life, not just because of the physical pain, but be also because of the the spiritual pain as he's on the cross and he's taking our sins, all of our sins, everyone's sins, taking them on the cross, on himself. Now, one commentator helped me understand just how much worse uh, the pain must have been than anything I can imagine. In 1968, scientists for the first time discovered the remains of the man crucified in Jesus' era. Uh, era and uh, the victim was nailed to the cross in a sitting position both legs over sideways with the nail penetrating the sides of both feet just below the heel the arms were stretched out each stabbed by a nail in the forearm dr nico pass hebrew university anatomy professor says this was a compulsive position a difficult and unnatural posture evidently to increase the agony of the sufferer. So this corrects the traditional visioning of the crucifixion with both palms nailed to the cross and the legs stretching straight, straight down with a nail piercing the feet frontally. The victim of the cross represented miserable humanity, reduced to the last degree of impotence, suffering, and degradation. The penalty of crucifixion combined all the most ardent tormentor could desire. Torture, exposure, degradation, and certain death distilled drop by drop it was an ideal form of torture. You and I will hopefully never feel that kind of pain, and yet even in that pain, he took the time to speak to his mother and to the Apostle John, making sure she was taken care of. When I'm in pain, I yell. I don't tolerate pain well at all. So if I had been on the cross, I, I wouldn't have paid any attention to anybody around me. I just would have been suffering, too focused on the pain my body's feeling. But Jesus here speaks to his mother, and also from the other Gospels we see that he spoke to his Father in heaven and also one of the thieves who was next to him. And he even prayed for God to forgive his enemies. 
So the next time someone tells you, I've done too many bad things and there's no way God would ever love and forgive me, you can say, yes, there is. And you can explain the pain he went through. But he's full of love and compassion for all the world, even those who crucified him. He wasn't thinking of himself. He was thinking of the world. He was thinking of you and me. Next, Jesus asks for a drink, and the soldiers give him sour wine. Now, don't, don't confuse that with um, the, the wine mixed with myrrh that was offered to him on the way to the cross. Um, that would have helped him with the pain. But this wine was actually meant to keep the person alive longer so they could experience more pain and torture before they died. Well, what's so significant about this wine? Once again, to fulfill prophecy, uh, fulfilling Psalm 69, 21, uh, and Jesus knew it. After the wine wet his dry mouth, just enough to speak, he said, it is finished. Uh, many movies portray Jesus saying this sadly, but I tend to agree with some pastors who believe that this was a shout of triumph. It is finished. I fulfilled my Father's will. Taken the sin of the world upon myself. Death has no power over me and my followers. It is finished. And in three days I'm going to show you just how uh, finished it really is. That I truly am God. I've done this for you. Then he bows his head peacefully. But notice what it says next. It says he gave up his spirit. In John chapter 10, verse 17 to 18, Jesus said, I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Jesus didn't die until he gave up his spirit. Death and the grave had no power over him. So remember that the next time that you're struggling through something. Remember what he did for you. Remember that he has power over death and the grave and over everything. And he is our God. Lastly, he was buried, but not finished. Jesus was buried, but not finished. Uh, if the crucifixion were the end of the story, then we wouldn't be here today. After he died, he needed to be buried. But notice how hypocritical these Jewish leaders are. It's the preparation day, Pilate. It's a high day. It's a holy day for us. Don't keep those bodies hanging up there. Normally, the Romans did leave the bodies hanging for days as a sign to the people that they, were, they would suffer the same fate if they dared to fight against Rome. And on top of that, it was the last blow to the crucified person publicly humiliating them and allowing the beasts to eat their flesh. But the Jews didn't want the bodies hanging because they believed it polluted and contaminated their land. And that would ruin the Passover for them. The other two thieves were still alive at this point, And in order to get the Jews to uh, leave them alone and to make the thieves die quicker, the Romans broke their legs. And as if they weren't suffering enough already, but now they're either going to suffocate to death because they won't be able to raise themselves up for air, or they're going to go into shock and die. Um, and normally, crucifixion could last a lot longer than a few hours. Jesus uh, died um, a lot quicker than most did, and it's because this was all part of prophecy. This was all happening uh, for us. Um, but these thieves, they were still alive after Jesus died. And so they, they break their legs so that they'll die. Um, Jesus was already dead, so another prophecy was fulfilled that none of his bones would be broken. Instead, they pierced his side with a spear. And I believe there's two reasons why blood and water poured out. For one thing, it was indisputable evidence that Jesus was actually dead, not in a coma, not faking it, as some liberal theologians and pastors try to say. He was still alive. That's why he was able to, to come back, because he was still alive. That's a lie. He was, a, he, he was dead. Uh, but I believe there was a spiritual symbolism from it as well. We're told in 1 John 1, verse 7, that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses or purifies us from all sin. The picture that's given there is of blood and water washing away our sin. 
Jesus, Jesus washing away our sin with his blood, cleansing of water. And on top of that, the, the piercing also fulfilled another prophecy. They shall look on him who they pierce. And Jesus still had some faithful followers. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had hidden their faith in Jesus because they feared the other Pharisees and Sadducees. But now they're putting that fear aside and they're doing extremely brave things. They, they go to Pilate, they ask to bury Jesus, to which Pilate says yes. And so they're really putting their reputations on the line because both of them are members of the Sanhedrin. They're rich and prestigious members of society. They're completely going against the high priest and the members of the Sanhedrin because they, they, uh, they didn't think Jesus was worthy of a burial, the, the Sanhedrin, but Joseph and Nicodemus did. And then the, the two men take the time to dress his body with strips of linen and spices. They give him a proper and honorable burial. Why would they do it knowing that they might be excommunicated or, or kicked out of the Sanhedrin? The answer is because Jesus was special to them. Jesus did something in their lives that changed them. And uh, they were willing to risk everything in order to give him the proper burial. And I believe that that shows that they became true followers of his. And they would have seen him resurrected after this and, and known that's our Messiah. Well, the, the tomb belonged to Joseph and was in the garden close by. So they placed his body in the tomb. The other Gospels tell us that they rolled a huge stone across the opening of the cave so no one could get in. And then they left, unsure of what was going to happen next. Now, as I close this sermon, I'd like everyone to think about some things. Uh, I'm going to ask, ask you a question for you to ponder. Are you living your life for Jesus as if you were right there with him at the cross, seeing all of that horrible pain and agony? That you went through. That should affect your actions. The way you talk, the way you treat people, the way you tell others about him, the way you worship. Are you living your life for Jesus as if his love means more to you every day? If it does, then you should be growing in your walk with him. He died for us so that we could have a relationship with him. And a relationship is meant to be, uh, to be built and to be strengthened over time. Are you afraid, afraid to point people to the cross? Don't be afraid because God is with us. His word does not return void. And by the way, this time of year is a great time to talk about the cross and what Jesus did because it's Easter. And we can tell people about him. And they're, they're, they're more willing to listen about the true meaning behind Easter. Jesus being resurrected. Jesus wants to take people's sorrow and turn it into joy. And they need to know about it. So will you make that commitment? Make that commitment and tell, and tell them. Jesus went through all of that gruesome torture so that their lives could be transformed as well. Our lives could be transformed. Don't hide your faith in him. Let us pray. We love you so much, Almighty God, and we thank you for your word. Thank you for what you did for us on the cross. Uh, it's very hard to read the, the uh, account in the Bible of, of what they did to you. God, how gruesome it was. But we thank you for doing it for us. We thank you that we'll be able to come back next Sunday and celebrate. She didn't stay in the grave. She was risen. And now you're alive and at the right hand of the Father praying for us, loving us, and, uh, and ready to welcome us home when we take our last breath. We, we look forward to that day. Until then, may we be faithful to you. May we tell others about you. And may we honor you with, with our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.